This is Terms of Reference. I'm your host, Stephen Laddick. Annika shelley Grehen is the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Impact Consulting. Prior to founding Impact, Annika worked for UNDP in Moldova and for the World Bank in Rwanda, Sudan, Bhutan, and Tanzania. Annika also worked in the United States for PricewaterhouseCoopers Securities Mergers and Acquisition Team and Riggs Capital Partners Venture Capital Team. Annika holds a Bachelor in Business and a Master's in International Relations. I spoke with Annika in Sweden. Hi there, Annika. Thank you so much for being on the Terms of Reference podcast today. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Can you please tell me, where, where is it that we're calling you again? Uh, I'm currently based in Sweden. Tell me, Annika, what is it that you're doing right now at Impact Consulting? Can you tell me you know, what you're, you're hoping to do, what the organization's focus is, those kinds of things? Yes. Well, uh, after living and working abroad uh, outside of my um, home country, Sweden, for almost 18 years, you know, working in the private and development sector, um, focusing mostly on U.S. and Africa, but also a bit on uh, Europe and Asia. I have recently actually returned here uh, to Sweden, and I am continuing the work that I've done in the past, both in the private sector um, and for the development sectors, but now just under my own consultancy, which, yes, I call impact consulting. Tell, tell me about what it is that you were doing just before you decided to come home and, and start this new venture. Well, my most recent assignment has been with the World Bank. So I've actually worked as a consultant uh, for the last, I think now, eight years, uh, primarily in Africa and a tiny bit in Asia. Uh, and I've worked mostly on um, human development uh, policy, also a bit with various ministries of finance. Uh, so a lot of um, program and policy uh, development and guide, uh, guidance to uh, ministries. Give me, give me a specific example of that. What does it mean when you say policy guidance or you know, supporting that effort? And what country specifically were you working in last? Okay. Well, Rwanda is the country where I spent... Uh, most of my time in Africa and in Rwanda as an example uh, I worked across a number of different um, programs in various capacities but one of the main initiatives that I was part of initiating was uh, the World Bank's support to the government of Rwanda of its economic development and poverty reduction strategy and uh, one of the three flagship programs on the, under this strategy was the, uh, the country's new VP program, VP uh, Umerenge, which uh, is a program that was envisioned to really support the most poor and vulnerable in the country. Uh, and it was back in 2000, and I would say, eight a vision of the government and then minister uh, in Rwanda for the Ministry of Local um, Affairs. Um, and we then helped them develop into pilot projects for cash transfers and public works, um, which also included a component that we're currently now trying to support more, which is more of a microfinancing component. But we helped them design it from a policy perspective to a program that was piloted and now scaled up and is in the process of being scaled up nationally. What's the biggest and, challenge from taking in Rwanda, taking something from the germ of an idea to a policy to then actually implementing programs? Like, Can you walk me through some of the challenges there? Yeah, well, I would actually start with answering a little bit in a different way. Uh, I would say that Rwanda is actually a very pleasant country to work with from a policy perspective for, because the government is very committed to making a lot of changes uh, that we as um, professionals in the development sector would like to see. So we actually have a client often that is very eager to kind of bring on our expertise and being very open to learn and try new ideas. Uh, and so obviously uh, it's a very nice environment to work with. Uh, some of the challenges, I mean, obviously you always have, in, in the beginning of the program, we had capacity at the central 
level being an issue. I mean, for the government of Rwanda, they had never really designed, they had a lot of social protection, similar projects. A lot of, or the main program was targeted to the uh, the survivors of the, the genocide um, and sort of specific to their country context, but they had not really had a comprehensive program and wanted to start thinking about social protection a little bit more broadly. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we had to work with them in the beginning to really define what social protection means and what kind of programs different countries have used in order to uh, try to really get to uh, the most poor out in the rural areas primarily uh, and provides different ways of helping them support their livelihoods in a way that will hopefully bring them you know, closer to or above the poverty line and just help them support the regular basic needs and consumption. And what were, what were some of the examples that you were able to put on the table for the Rwandans about either other countries in Africa or other countries around the world? They're, very generally speaking, I mean, you have a lot of in-depth dialogue in, you know, throughout the entire development of this. So, and a lot of that policy dialogue ended up, we had in the beginning uh, and then over the years, obviously it's an evolving process. You go from like piloting something to then, you know, tweaking the program and the pilot before you expand it to other sectors. And then you kind of monitor it and see what works, what doesn't work, and then you build on. So, um, you know, in, in Rwanda, there was a, clear desire to uh, try to do um, cash transfers to uh, as part of their program. Uh, a lot of countries uh, opt to do it as a conditional cash transfer. Rwanda, after some thinking, wanted to do it without a condition. Because for, for, for people who are listening to this show right now who aren't familiar with what a cash transfer is, can you just sort of tell us in layman terms what does that mean? Basically, it is money that goes into the hand of uh, in this case, the household, um, the, so the, the main direct, person, direct beneficiary. The yes, mm -hmm. the beneficiary. Yes, uh, to support their uh, daily consumption. Okay. Uh, so the the challenge is to identify in a country with you know at the time, I think forty six percent living on in poverty. Uh, you know, it's and you have limited resources. You cannot afford to provide cash to every single person in need. So you have to, in a context where you don't have any registries or possibly birth certificates or anything like that, you have to be innovative in how do you kind of find these people and figure out who is in most need and then, you know, then decide a way of how you can actually transfer the money from the central, uh, the central resources, if you will. I mean, it could be obviously it's sitting in a bank account centrally, and then you need to get the money out to the hands of the poor. And a lot of times they don't even have a bank account. They might not even ever have been to a bank. So there's a lot of practical issues around this, and there's a lot of things that go into the design of a cash transfer uh, in, in how you do it practically and how you ensure that the money gets the right amount, gets to the hand of the right person. Mm. Uh, this is a very complex area, and Rwanda has been rather innovative. I mean, they have been using a lot of their communities to help identify, for example, uh, the people most in need. And this is a program that's still, this many years later, is still evolving. Uh, the World Bank and other stakeholders is involved in trying to really define the program now when the program is up and running to really ensure that it becomes more efficient and, and really serves the needs of the people and it's done in a transparent way uh, with clear accountability measures within the program built in, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but these are just some of the things that I've been working on Rwanda. I mean, it's just one program, uh, but probably the main one. Tell me about the, the, you know, you keep mentioning a team of people that you were working with. Um, you were working as an independent consultant. So were you working with, as a group of consultants or were there bank employees? Uh, was it, would you, are you considering your team, uh, your Rwandan counterparts, or what's that, what did that well, look like? I mean, I was originally hired by the bank uh, for a short-term consultancy, and I ended up being sent to Rwanda to provide support to the uh, director of budget in Rwanda that was new and in, that needed to put together some financial numbers in order to um, 
show somewhere that you know show where some of the spending had been recently uh, before the money is being sent there's a lot of things that go into making sure that the money in previous years have gone into the right sectors and there's a lot of check and balances that go into kind of like making sure that there's ongoing dialogue that it follows what has been agreed in previous projects and I ended up in Rwanda as a short-term consultant and I thought it was going to be temporary uh, but ended up working very well with the Ministry of Finance there and ended up staying on for longer assignments. And before I knew it, I was basically working full time for the World Bank as a consultant, but being pulled in different directions, primarily in Rwanda. And eventually that's how I ended up on the social protection project that I just mentioned. So tell us how uh, someone from Sweden... Uh, get finds himself in Rwanda eventually. Was it always your intention to uh, be a part of international development work? Um, and you know, sort of, did you study that in your university, or was this something that you, you had a you know a, an, an aha moment, so to speak, and you're like, oh, I've got to I've got to go do that. Mm-hmm. Take us back to sort of how you got to where you are. Well, I do have a private sector background, and so I was always very interested in international. Uh, issues. I thought, I guess, when I first started, I will have that business, international business hat. Then my move towards international area and development sector was then a, a very conscious decision uh, after a few years in the private sector, and it coincided with the aftermath of September 11th. I had been thinking for a while after work in the U.S., which for me as a Swedish citizen originally was international, I thought that the U.S. market and the sort of corporate finance work I was doing was very U.S. focused, and I was feeling that it wasn't international enough for me. The U.S. became almost like my home, and I wanted to broaden my views and work more internationally. And so after September 11th, when the financial markets were not doing so well, um, there was some restructuring within my uh, venture capital group, and... Uh, I decided to think about uh, changing careers potentially, and I have to say that the the f- main factor was that I felt like I wasn't driven by making more money. I didn't wake up at the end of the day and cared too much about where the stock market was that particular day or how much money we made for a particular uh, client uh, or how big my bonus was at the end of the year. So I decided I wanted to do something it was more in line with what I felt passionate about, and I decided that was more international development. So I took a master in international relations at Johns Hopkins in Washington, D.C., a School of Advanced International Studies. And I then, by coincidence, as opposed to being an intentional decision, by coincidence, I ended up uh, at the World Bank. I was actually in grad school in Bologna, Italy at the time on, on the spring break when I received an email uh, for a consultancy. It was a widespread email, but I saw it and I hesitated for a while. I was on spring break and had a brief break to check my emails, but I decided after some convincing of some of my friends to just like send in my CV just in case. And a few months months later, I was actually in Rwanda and have been going there ever since. So I really didn't, I wasn't in the process of thinking of my next step when I was in grad school. I thought I still had some time and Things happened, and I'm actually very grateful for uh, for that sort of spur of the moment email. I understand that you've worked for UNDP as well. Was that yeah. prior prior to your master's degree, or just after? Well, no, it was in between. So I had so the two year program we had one summer, and coming from the private sector, corporate America, I had worked crazy, crazy hours, 120 hour work weeks for several, several years. And I thought, and then going straight into grad school, I, you know, which is also in many ways exciting and amazing, but also very tiresome. So I thought, you know, I will maybe take my first summer off. I, you know, as a kid, I never had my summer off because I played competitive tennis. So I always would compete all summer long. So I thought maybe this will be my first summer just doing what I want, you know, just taking a vacation. But I made one exception. I applied for one 
one internship with the UNDP that I thought was really interesting. And I said, if I get this internship, then I will do this instead of uh, taking my vacation. And I got the internship. It was uh, an initiative to strengthen the public-private um, partnership in various regions uh, in the world. It was called the Growing Sustainable Business Initiative uh, that the UNDP was launching. And uh, I was mapped to Moldova. And I thought, well, I wasn't really thinking Moldova would be my first choice, but it's a shorter assignment. It's only a, uh, three plus months. I will get a chance to live in Eastern Europe. I don't know when that chance will come again. And I did that. And I have to say it was an amazing, amazing, very enriching time. And I, I couldn't think of a better, better way to have spent my summer. I learned so much, and I also think that it opened my eyes also for what I'm doing now in Sweden, really thinking about integrating the development work with the private sector work and kind of make sure that they don't operate in parallel. Give me a reason why the work in, in Moldova was so enriching. And is there a particular story or, or a moment that you had in Moldova where you're like, ah, this is, this is it, this is really, I knew that I made the right choice? There were several moments, but I can give you one. When I came there, uh, the assignment was to set up this new unit within the UNDP in their offices there. And um, there was a Polish woman that had gotten a two-year contract, and I was going to support her. So we both were new in the country, and we hit it off from the start. In, in fact, she's still today a very, very close friend of mine. So obviously, we worked, you know, two very driven women that really had come to Moldova, not because, you know, of the location per se, but to really come there because we really feel like you want to try to make a difference. Uh, Moldova is one of Europe's poorest countries, so um, it, it's you know, and it's this very small, isolated country in, in, in many ways. So there's a lot of challenges and a lot of needs there. And one of the things then we started doing was to try to figure out what are the main industries in Moldova, uh, and then what are the uh, suppliers to these industries, because a lot of times the suppliers further down the value chain end up being the smaller farmers or other uh, poor Moldovans that are um, supplying to these uh, or providing um, you know, their labor to these uh, different industries. So one of the main companies was a carpet company that uh, purchased a lot of the wool for, uh, from the farmers in Moldova. But they had really poor uh, terms for these farmers. So it was very difficult for the farmers to generate and deliver all this wool when they didn't get paid until 90 days later. It was very hard for them to support their families. They had to you know, put a lot of cash up front and then wait for the, the payment. And sometimes the payments were delayed. And they had tried to raise this with the big uh, companies or the wool company before, but nothing, you know, the voices hadn't really been heard. So in this case, we were really able to go and talk to the management of the, wool, uh, the carpet company and have them change the terms of reference and really have them understand the challenges that the farmers experienced back in the field and trying to raise these sheep and uh, really try to improve their living conditions by just you know, negotiating better terms for, for payment. And, of course, before we had this dialogue, we would go out and visit the farmers. And I remember very well coming sort of from the office environment and suddenly finding myself out surrounded by pigs and sheep and, you know, very muddy sort of very simple housing out in the countryside of Moldova. But then coming back a few weeks or months later and being able to celebrate with the farmers who you know, we're so happy to give us some food and share with their families because we have really made an impact in their lives in terms of how they work, uh, how, how they could provide for the families. So I think that will be a story I will take with me from Moldova. Wow, that's a great story of, of super tangible impact. Sometimes uh, we speak with lots of people who are independent consultants or do these types of consultancies and that's one of the biggest frustrations is there's a lot of report writing, there's a lot of, you know, meetings, but the actual tangible impact is sometimes hard to see. That's great. Yeah, no, and it's funny because I still have these shoes that I used to have to work to Moldova, and I love it because every time I see them, I remember how I had to kind of, every time we go out in the field, I had to really sort of push off all the mud from them because they were just 
completely covered in mud, but it was kind of a sense of, you know, I'm actually not just walking these hallways. I also am out in the field and maybe next time for my next assignment, I should really have two pair of shoes, one for, for <laughs> walking in the field, <laughs> one for walking in the office. That, that will be a tool and tip that we'll put down for everyone. Make sure that you bring two pairs of shoes to Moldova. You've had something of an unusual experience making the transition from the private sector to the development sector. It, 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 unless correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, sounds like, you know, hey, I'll, I'll apply to one internship with UNDP and you got it. And, you know, while you were still completing your, your master's degree, you were called in by the World Bank and that turned into a multi-year assignment. This is a fairly unusual experience. Do you think that there's a particular factor about your skills, your experience, how you interview that, that sets you apart? It would be nice to think there was something in particular. I think there is a combination of being lucky, being in the right place at the right time. But over the years also, I have learned that maybe all the very, very hard work I put into, uh, to, and I know there's a lot of people that put in a lot of hard work and still struggle. I mean, I think I'm in part, I'm going through that sort of transition today when I start my own consultancy, because that's, you know, out of Sweden, it's a new sort of market for me. So I see great potential. I'm very excited, but it is a little bit more of that trying really to figure out, uh, you know, not having everything served on the silver plate. But I have to say that I have been extremely lucky. At the same time, I have always made sure, and I don't know, possibly always trying to put that little extra in, so I'm always a little bit a step ahead. I don't know if that comes from just wanting to overprove to myself that I'm qualified, but I think at the same time, once opportunity has come, I have been able to capitalize on it. Because in fact, even my job at the at PricewaterhouseCoopers Securities back in 1998, my first job out of grad school, it was a complete fluke. Someone handed me a business card from a father who had been visiting campus uh, and the career center. And someone at the career center said, oh, but I have some pers- one person in mind for you. Uh, I will give her your business card. And I called this person, and he was on his way driving to the airport, I remember, in Houston. I never met this person. I never spoke to him again. But he promised to send my CV to someone in Washington, D.C. And that's where I got my job a month later, and that's where I moved, and that's where I pretty much had my base for the next 15 years. Wow, that's uh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have just yeah. been, you've been blessed, so to speak, let's just call it no, that. No, I, I definitely have. <laughs> now, the reason why my name came up at the Career Center that early on was because I was one of the few students who, eight months ahead of graduation, started to prepare my CV and, you know, being very active on campus and having a double degree while I also played on the tennis team probably helped, right? So it's sure. being in the right place at the right time. But, yeah, definitely putting in that extra effort. And then when the opportunity sort of comes, you, yeah, it's definitely luck in, in part, right? Well, there's always luck involved. I think they've scientifically proven that now, right? But you also create luck. Did you find that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, you did work in acquisitions, you did work in M&A, you did work in banking, essentially, and you found your longest term assignment with the World Bank. Did mm-hmm. you have, were you using the same skills in the private sector as you were in Rwanda? Is Did you have immediately transferable skills? You know, I, I'm i working on my second master, and I, I'm, you know, like a lot of us, you know, gone through education, uh, different rounds of education and everything, but I have never really, I don't think that you ever have the exact skills or experience for any particular job. I think the best skills you can bring is really to be very flexible and adaptable and quick to learn and really trying to understand what are the objectives and what's the mandates and then being able to both learn, you know, to have a big vision view and also a smaller vision view and knowing what your role is and uh, and what your strengths are and how you can contribute. Uh, and then also making sure you really deliver. Always have high quality on what you deliver and also kind of not losing sight too much about why you're there. Mm. Uh, I mean, if, if I wanted to make an impact working for the World Bank, I mean, I made a very conscious decision to be a consultant because I had worked for the corporate America and they owned my life for several years, and I didn't want to sell my soul to an institution again, but I really wanted to be working close to the client. I didn't necessarily want to have a fancy office or make that sort of 
career, traditional career path and deal with a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, Board Bank does unfortunately have a lot of bureaucracy, but I also think it's sort of just the nature of how development work sometimes is set up. We can talk about that separately, but uh, it's very difficult to avoid the bureaucracy. But as a consultant, there are pros and cons to it. But I felt that I had more options to be working closer to the client. I think, I mean, I, sorry. And in this I, case, in this case, the client is the beneficiary. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, obviously the beneficiary, well, the, the, the client is in this case, the government, hopefully the beneficiaries are the citizens mm, okay. by working with the client. I just wanted to make that distinction. So, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at least it's negotiable. I mean, there is no perfect world and we don't have perfect solution how to solve the world's poverty. So if someone can come up with that one perfect way of just making sure that there are no more poor, we will probably be wanting to know how that will work out. But obviously, in this case, we are working with a client, in this case, governments, to try to really help them better serve their citizens. And those are then in our mind, our beneficiaries. Mm. Take me back to what you were saying that uh, about a viewpoint that development is set up for bureaucracy. What What do you mean by that? Well, I just think that, and, and this comes to, again, having worked both in the private sector and the development sector. I've also worked a little bit on the grassroots through the NGO that my sister and I initiated four years ago uh, with some local NGO in Tanzania, and then also been working sort of from the, you know, more bigger institution to try to have an impact and try to better people's lives and whatnot. I mean, there's, I think that a lot of, rightfully, there should be a lot of monitoring of what all stakeholders are doing, including, of course, the most influential ones, like the World Bank, who gets and receives most of the money and obviously by default then has a lot of clout talking to the clients because they bring a lot of money to the table. Uh, and it is a very heavy organization in many, many ways. But it's very easy to criticize the World Bank also because... You know, there are a lot of very, very talented people within these institutions, but they are also constrained by the uh, um, bureaucracy in part because the check and balances that our outsiders demand of the institution also creates a lot of the bureaucracy that then makes it difficult for us to do our work. So it's like a balancing act. I mean, mm. we need to have all these check and balances within our structure in order to meet sort of all the demands of making sure that we follow all rules and regulations and we, you know, we, we are transparent as much as possible and we have thought about all possible aspects when designing a project. You know, there are legal ramifications, there are environmental issues, there are gender issues, there are... I mean, ju just name it. We have to consider them all. And that's part of the demand from outside, that they want to really m make sure that they can monitor and have a say in what the World Bank does because it is so influential. But at the same time, being in the inside, it also causes a lot of layers that we have just to deal with. And we're in many ways happy to do it because we understand why they are there. But it's also a lot of time and work spent in Washington just trying to get through those layers when, in fact we then are not spending time in the field really working with the client or understanding the needs of the beneficiary. So it is sort of a balancing act of having those check and balances of a big institution. The bureaucracy has to be there, but it's also very difficult to work within those institutions because of the bureaucracy is there. And what, uh, and about, I, what about the pace of the work? One of the things that we find, or I, I have found speaking with other people here in terms of references, uh, they find a large challenge in just the slow movement of the machinery. Was that also yeah. a frustration for you? I mean, I cannot speak for everyone at the World Bank, but I mean, everyone knows there's so many rules and regulations and restrictions that we have to follow and consider all the time. But sometimes you might wonder, what does this really have to do with our project? But we have to consider them and ask for input and revisions and different things that obviously is there to make sure that we have the best possible design that we can ever have in order to ensure that the money is spent in the, most, the best way possible, ultimately to have the most outcome and impact on the ultimate beneficiaries that we are trying to sort of help. It, you know, it is a lot of time spent to deal with that internally. So that's why I say 
you know, everyone has to choose how and where they want to work to make a difference. I think a lot of people, they have a lot of criticisms towards the World Bank or just helping in general, but they don't have any practical solutions to offer. So to the people that always are very quick at criticizing right and left, I would say when you criticize, please also bring, you know, a a proposal or a practical uh, suggestion for a way forward, because I think most people are open for it if there's a better way to do things. Uh, And for the people that work on the grassroots level and think that that's the only way to impact the world, I think there's a lot of challenges working on the grassroots level too. Uh, And I've seen those challenges. It's not very straightforward and you work on a very, on a small scale and it's very difficult to try to change the world only by working on a grassroots level. Mm. Likewise, only working from the world big institution might not be the right way either, but every professional within their own role has to define what they think is the best way forward and then and then decide possibly if that's the right way forward or not, but not criticize without knowing because no institution or organization is perfect. And in the end of the day, it's a human being is trying to work efficiently and that's not always the easiest thing to coordinate. Sure. I basically feel that there has to be there has to be an understanding also of the challenges that each institution is dealing with. It's never black and white. There's never uh, a perfect solution. There's a lot of compromises and pros and cons to every decision that's being made. And you can't try to please everyone and try to achieve everything in one project. But it's important that we have a dialogue and that the big institutions like the World Bank and the donor community, together with the civil society and the NGOs and everything that exists in the field, they work together. And I actually think in Rwanda, in some ways, they've had a lot of coordination between all these different organizations and stakeholders, and they are actually contributing to a common agenda, which is very I think very uh, much more efficient, where everyone brings their own strength to the table and everyone has an, a different mandate. But in the end of the day, they all try to sort of work towards the same goals. It sounds to me like, and perhaps I'm you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you may be entering a stage where you're one of those people who are going to offer some of those proposals for a way to do things better. And that's by starting your own consulting company and, as you said earlier, working on this connection between private and public. Mm-hmm. So double part, two part question here. What was the moment that you decided to make the leap? You had a good thing going in Rwanda. You uh, had a good thing going with the World Bank. But you woke up one day and you said, mm, it's time for me to go home. It's time for me to start my own thing. What was that moment? And then let's let's sort of take the conversation back to where is Impact Consulting going and and. And, and we'll go from there. The move back home to Sweden was a very personal decision. In one way, it was one of the first times in my life I'd made a big life change without kind of letting my career lead the way. And that's in part maybe why this transition also has been really exciting and different, uh, but also to some degree challenging, but not necessarily only from a professional perspective, but in part also from a personal perspective. So the decision to move back home to Sweden was a personal one and a very personal factor influenced that. But it was also at a time when I had been at the World Bank for for quite some time uh, and I was ready for a change. And I also started feeling that the travel from Washington to um, Africa started to become very time-consuming and draining. Um, And I thought... You know, I love Africa. I would like to stay engaged in that uh, on that continent, but I can do so from Europe, and it would also be much easier accessible. So, talking about getting closer to the client, you know, I'm actually much more. I'm closer to Africa from Europe, and I could potentially be doing similar work or the same work or a different type of work, but you know, in different shape or form, but still. From Sweden. So you decided to start Impact Consulting. What's your next? Yeah, I, what, what's your, what's your next move there? Is it? Um, uh, have you secured your first clients? Have you? Are, are you starting to work? Or what's yeah, your next? Yeah, sorry, move? I never answered the second part of uh, of your yeah. question. Mm-hmm. So the the consultancy is now in its current form is still emerging, but the objective is to work for economic and social development by integrating uh, different aspects of development and private sector development. 
And of course, this draws from my personal and professional experience, right? You know, I see a need Absolutely. here. Mm-hmm. Um, and too often, the two sectors work in parallel, in my opinion, and too many companies in developed countries, Sweden included, don't see the potential that exists to develop for the so-called bottom of the pyramid, while governments in developing countries struggle to find ways to improve growth and you know, address labor market issues, such as access to financing and ensuring employment for youth, etc. So the aim of the consultancy is really to support the needed dialogue around what impact and sustainability means in practice and when and then work with and across different actors in different sectors to explore sustainable business models that will have social, environmental and economic impact. The consultancy will also try to focus more on Africa's emerging market through the overall concept of social economic impact, or rather focus on Africa, although the, the concept of social economic impact can be applied to all regions, of course. But since my, my heart and my interest and my uh, experiences from Africa, I really would like to help put Africa on the map. So in brief, there are three current areas that I focus on. One is uh, I will con- uh, it will continue to work and provide policy and program expertise in a range of areas to develop an organization such as the World Bank which is currently a client. I'm going to Rwanda next week uh, to support develop, you know, and in this capacity it will be to support development similar to what I have been doing. But now hopefully looking a little bit closer at labor market issues from a government perspective. So kind of more labor market focus than social protection program focus. And then I'm also beginning to work with private sector and other organizations primarily based here in Sweden then to capitalize on the emerging African market. Uh, so in part to open their eyes to the tremendous opportunities that exist in Africa and to find innovative ways to co-create within these markets. So especially with a focus on the bottom of the pyramid for mutual benefits and exchange. And here there is a range of different clients I'm talking to uh, and I'm hoping within the next year some of these uh, discussions will emerge to some uh, interesting consultancies. But that, that's still early in the process, mm-hmm. but I'm very, very hopeful. There's a lot of actually interest now uh, in the recent year or so in Africa's market. And then in general, just one of the, the third thing that I'm hoping to do is really to engage and support different stakeholders in my home region here of Gothenburg to be a driver for change in the area of social sustain, sustainable business and to support Sweden's innovative climate by working toward putting innovation into practical solutions. So today much of innovation occurs for the top of the pyramid and or is very academically focused, but there is a demand for both private and development sectors to broaden the scope of innovation to meet the needs of low and high mar- uh, high income countries and also to find ways to bring innovation to markets. Mm. So the, what is emerging here is more of trying to make this region, I mean, now a lot of things are happening in the Stockholm area, but there's a lot of potential, in particular here from the private sector, to really work with companies here on issues of sustainability. Sweden is a leader in innovation in many ways, but it's, like I said, trying to take innovation and put them actually into market solution, which is a challenge. And also thinking about new market, one being looking at Africa as a new emerging market or alternatively thinking about the bottom of the pyramid, more generally speaking, and innovate for that bottom of the pyramid. And in that, with the bottom of the pyramid, I mean sort of the bottom, the bottom of like the f- 4 million people in the world that sort of live with so much less than majority. What does it, now that you've, you know, you're about to head back to Rwanda here on, an, on another assignment, how has your day-to-day changed now that you've, you're, you're starting your own organization, you're starting your own consultancy? Have you noticed that there's different ad- administrative pieces you need to take care of, uh, business development type, type things that you need to do? How has, the, how has that changed? In some ways, it hasn't cha- changed. In some ways, it's just the scenery that changed. But um, I would say that I am very used to now, after eight years being a consultancy on the run, to always have my office with me in my purse. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always on the go. You know, I can work from anywhere at any time. And so that's kind of nice and that's the same. And it's just depending on what I have that day or particular project or what particular client I have. So for example, next week I will be back in Rwanda for two weeks and now I'll come back here. So that is pretty much the same. And then it's more like the scenery of being actually in Europe, uh, which is a bit different. But 
Um, the biggest change professionally and some things that is taking a little bit of my time now is actually to do business in Sweden. Sweden, you know, you have to, I just need to uh, go through the processes of establishing the company here, you know, through uh, registering their company uh, in Sweden through the tax authorities and everything like that. And that's just like upfront, a little bit time consuming when you, since I haven't worked here before, uh, it's uh, all new processes. So um, and Sweden is pretty strict and you have to follow all the rules and regulations. So that's like a learning experience, but I actually kind of like it in one way because I'm, you know, being a business professional, I think it's a good thing that I actually, uh, I'm going through this. I worked with a lot of startups in my previous career, uh, and now I'm sort of having to go through some of the, the hurdles myself. Um, so that is really what's taking some of my time now that I never really had to worry about previously. But that's kind of like just in the initial phase, I think. Once things are run up and running, I can be more focused on the client. And then I don't really think, besides the fact that the client types might be different and I might have a different angle, and I might be more focused on uh, possibly engaging with universities and try to put Africa on the map. It's something I haven't had to do before, but here people are still very uncertain about Africa uh, and see it as a continent that, you know, is struggling. Uh, and tell so, me, tell me a little bit about that from from you personally and your personal perspective. You've spent such a long time outside your country. Are you able to relate your stories? Are you able to relate your experience to? friends, families, other colleagues that you're working with there? This has been one of the challenges coming home, actually, because, so I mentioned I'm taking a second MBA, a second master's, and it is actually an executive MBA here at the University of Gothenburg. It's a great program, wonderful colleagues. They all sort of, sort of different managerial positions uh, through, from different sort of corporate companies in this region. And, you know, it's, it's a very professional network. Everyone is smart. They're well-traveled. You know, they all spend a lot of time in China and India and some in Brazil and obviously well-traveled all over Europe. Very internationally focused global companies that they work and rep- uh, for and represent. But no one's gone to Africa? Uh, no, I don't <laughs> think anyone has. And in fact, you know, it's the first challenge was when I started talking about what I do, they said they didn't understand. And I thought, what is it that you don't understand? I mean, I thought maybe, am I talking too fast in English? I mean, they're, they're, they're fluent in English. I just <laughs> couldn't figure out what it was. And then I realized it was just that my my way of explaining what I do was not necessarily clear to them because I had to sort of really think hard about how I presented myself and the experience I had because it didn't necessarily fit into, you know, sort of the, the corporate world that exists here. Um, kind of like the type of expertise and, you know, advice to governments. And and for me, it, I, I see the government and the private sector clients very similar. I mean, you advise possibly a board of directors or um, uh, the management team, just as well as you, you know, advise the minister for a particular government, right? And then under that ministry or that company, you have subunits and then further down until like, you know, on the on the private side, you would have like the, the manufacturing possibly uh, floors with the blue collar workers and maybe uh, further down on when you talk to a government, you, you work with a lot with local uh, local staff out in the field, the people that are actually, you know, engaging directly with the, you know, the, the citizens, you know, are working very closely there. And you have to sort of, you know, you work with all of this different, you know, when you think strategically on how you're going to develop policy for a company or a government is different, but at the same time, you have to have the same time of vision and think through, you know, how are you really going to be able to make a difference for what you're trying to achieve? I mean, a lot of times you can apply a similar concept. It's all about trying to understand what is needed and how things work and really talk to all different layers within an organization, be it the company or uh, government, to make sure that you have a full understanding of what is needed. Uh, so it's not enough, for example, to go in, in a company and just talk to corporate management or go in and talk to the minister and think that you're going to figure out how to s- you know, deliver a product to the market or help a beneficiary out in the field unless, unless you actually talk to them and understand the market or you understand the needs of the beneficiary that you're trying to help. 
Uh, so it's really trying to understand that it's development and co and how business is run. It's not completely different. It's just different. You have different desired outcomes and you have different understanding of uh, maybe how you finance things and how you how you create impact. Uh, you know, in the corporate world, you might measure return based on the bottom line versus in a country, you might measure the bottom line by looking at how many lives you saved through some policies of possibly implementing mosquito nets and fight, you know, minimize malaria among children or something like that. But a lot of times what takes you to, to that, I mean, it takes different expertise, obviously, but it, the clients itself is not that different. It's people, there are institutions are trying to have an impact in some way. And uh, you can apply a lot of the policy and strategic thinking and program development in similar ways. I mean, if you do a policy, if you have a policy in a country, you still need to be able to finance that policy and that strategy that you want to implement. How are you going to finance it? Uh, the same thing if you want to put a uh, product on the market. And I'm not trying to say that they are the same. I'm just saying that strategically, you need to understand the different client, but it doesn't mean that they are two separate worlds. And they, uh, they interact every day, don't they? I mean, they're, they're, and, they're, and they're the different. Partners. So if you talk, so what I'm trying to tell, you know, people here now is like, understand that I don't come from planet March because I've been trying to work with governments, you know, they deal with a lot of, have a lot of similar challenges with, that the companies have. I mean, they need to make sure they have capacity just as well as the company needs to make sure they have the right human resources to, to execute on what they need. You know, they need to be financed. They need to have bringing in expertise to figure out how certain things work um, down the system. They need to be able to measure results. They just mes measure results differently. Uh, they need to have check and balances to make sure that there's no corruption in the system just as well as you know, companies need to make sure that, you know, you monitor the bottom line and there is, like, resources that are used efficiently. It's just different ways, but, you you know, you don't, it's not different planets we're talking about. And they are interacted. And I, in my opinion, I think they should be interacting more because there's a lot of mutual benefits to interacting. Two more questions for you. One thing is you said, you know, when you're actually interacting with your classmates at your MBA or some people there in Sweden, uh, or even if you were you and I were to sit down right now and, and have a cup of coffee, there's always that one story you tell. You told the story about the, the wool farmers in, uh, sorry, the, the wool manufacturers in Moldova. Mm -hmm. Is there another one of those stories that you know you're sitting down with somebody just a friendly basis, and you're like, this is my go-to story about that time that you know the car broke down in the middle of the hills in Rwanda, and we did this. Is there one of those stories that you have? God. You know, that one is probably the hardest question. Because um, somehow, well, I, I don't really have a, you know, one of those stories from Rwanda. I mean, and there's a lot of obviously, small anecdotes, but my, my most recent assignment was actually in Sudan. Mm. And... The north or That's the south? The, the proper Sudan or, or? Sorry, no. Yes, it was. In, I was in Khartoum, and okay. I didn't get to travel much. It was uh, during uh, some of the more difficult times there, where uh, a lot of the the regions were not safe to travel to. And my assignment there at the time was really to do an assessment of the government's um, programming. Um, Sudan, obviously, is a huge country, and um, you, you, you cannot in a couple of weeks go out to every district and do a thorough analysis so the initial analysis in the central base and then there's a possibility to build on that assessment working in the different um, states uh, so my work was fortunately during this time very cartoon focused but it was uh, I guess because it was such a contrast to Rwanda the weather was different uh, one is incredibly hot you know you have to really cover yourself um everything in arabic and i will have to make my rounds there I, I don't have a particular story more than i thought it was amazing because i just moved to sweden at the time and i find myself in this completely different setting um but i within weeks or actually less within days i had an amazing group of local and international friends who um, 
brought me on uh, and celebrated my birthday with me, uh, threw me a birthday party. And I realized that after a year in Sweden, I had more friends after a few days in Sudan. I mean, the culture there was, you know, people think it's very, uh, you know, it's a very, you know, it's restrictive country in terms of because of it, the political climate and possibly the, to some degree, the religion and the fact that a lot of women have to wear, wear a veil and everything, or not veil, but uh, headscarves and uh but the people are always the same. No matter where in this world you go, you can always find common factors. Like you can laugh and cry over the same things. Women talk about broken hearts. And, you know, it, if what makes us human is always, always there. And I thought that was very, very obvious when I went to Zidane in the sense that it was such a contrast to my to moving to Sweden, uh, and I love Sweden, but in one way, it's here, the culture is a little bit different, so it's taken longer to make friends here, and there, you know, you might have expected uh, to think it would be harder, and yet I loved it from day one. It was challenging to work there, extremely challenging, but the people I met uh, became friends for life, and I'm very, very grateful for that experience. And I think the lesson I take from that is, that you should always, always see the human behind every person that you meet and know that we have much more in common than we have in difference. And uh, I think this is sort of the driver behind why I do the work I do. I mean, there, there are people we're talking about. They're not just numbers um, in some reports. That was awesome. My last question for you, you're now going back and completing a degree, but there's others out there who either are you know, started sort of completing their bachelor's degree or completing their first master's or they're like you did many years ago, uh, considering making the, the transition from the private sector to development work or humanitarian aid work. What's the critical advice that, that you'd give to someone if they called you up and asked you, how did you make this happen? Or, or, you know, the critical advice you'd give for here's how you, how you can create success in a career like this. That's also a good question. I think that if you want to make this switch, I actually think that, especially today, I think it was harder a few years ago when I started thinking about it, you know, back in the day, I wanted to find a way to join them. They were still talking public private partnerships and stuff like that. But I find that now it's, more than ever a good time to really, really use that private sector experience to go into development and vice versa. Because so many times you are you do either or. It's kind of like you work on grassroots level or you work, you know, for a big fancy organization and you think that you will never want to turn to the other side. I think it's much better to be able to walk on both sides. Because then you can represent both sides, you can understand both sides. You can um, have more credibility when you criticize one side, either from within or from the outside. So I would really encourage people to try to, you know, work on the grassroots level, get field experience, but also try to work the fancy offices. Try to not be sort of, you know, I will only work for this type of organization, this organization only, but really try to broaden your experience. Work high and low and wide. Uh, and I think, especially today, you will be much more marketable. You can sell those skills much better because too many people, they are too early on, very narrow. Um, and I think in t today's world also, having that business background is a really good thing because we all realize at the end of the day how much we wish it or not, sustainability, and everyone talks about sustainability, but sustainability cannot be without economic sustainability. So we want to have social and environmental sustainability, but with that comes along economic sustainability. And I think that if you're in, if you are working sort of on business, you have something in the future if you understand the issues around social and, and environmental sustainability, but at the same time, if you if you, your passion is in making a change socially and environmentally, you're probably better off doing so if you also have a solid understanding on how businesses fundamentally run. Because if you can join those forces together, I think you have the best way to contribute in the future in a sustainable way. Anika, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a fantastic conversation. Well, thank you. You've been listening to the Terms of Reference podcast from aidpreneur.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Thank you.